Dear Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for declaring us as your children, that despite our sinfulness and our unworthiness and our unlovability, you love us just the same, and not just once, but forever. Help assure us in the hope of that promise, that because our Lord Jesus rose from the dead, all of those things have been fulfilled in him and are now ours through him. Uh, so when we have struggles in life or when we're despairing, remind us of those promises, either through those in our lives, in our Christian communities, or through the revelation of your word. And help us to not make a practice of sinning, but to seek to live in obedience to you through the gracious aid of the helper you have given us, the Holy Spirit. Now I ask your blessing upon our class today, that it may be edifying, that it may build us up in knowledge of faith, and your word, so that we may go out and be even better witnesses to your glory. In the name of Jesus, amen. amen. Okay, so if you have a catechism, open up your catechism to page 128. 128. So the way this, this catechism is typically set up is when you start a new unit, there's always a little introductory um, section before you get into the actual creed itself, in this case. Um, that helps kind of introduce the whole concept. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. And so the first thing I have in your outline, what does the word creed mean? It means believe. Does anybody know where it comes from? Credere. Huh? The Latin credere. Yeah, which is a verb that means I believe, right? So it, it is, in its first person singular form, it's credo, credo. Okay, but it means I believe. So what are the first two words we start the creed with? I believe. I believe, right? So we're making a statement of belief, a confession of faith, okay? Um, <clears throat> and this is not a new confession of faith. This is something that we share with the Christian church for thousands of years, okay? Um, and not even before it was known as the Christian church, creeds were being spoken. So let's open up our Bibles. To Deuteronomy chapter 6, and we're going to look at verse 4. I'll be super impressed if somebody knows what this means. You don't get anything practical, though. Sorry. Oh. <laughs> sort of like, whose line is it anyway? The games are made up and the points don't matter. <laughs> All right, Deuteronomy 6, chapter 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Does anybody know what this is called? We got a tip of the tongue phenomenon over here. Huh? Comes from a Hebrew word. It is called the Shema. This is the great Shema of the chosen people of God. Uh, and Shema, it's that because of the here. Shema is the Hebrew word for here. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Okay. So that's a creed that has been confessed by the people of God long, 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 long time ago. All right, so a rich tradition there. And now we'll take a look at Romans chapter 10. And just as a sort of for fun question, why do you think our creed is way longer than theirs? You might have been thinking, well, we should go back to that one. It's only one sentence. <laughs> One God and three persons. Okay, so we, we got a little bit more knowledge revealed to us about the Trinity. But what about the, in the second article of the Creed, the second big paragraph, what are we spending most of our time talking about? Jesus, right? And at this point, Jesus has not been incarnated yet. Right? And so uh, all of that stuff has not yet been revealed in the detail by which we confess it to be true. Right, so what, what they know is that the covenant that God has made with Israel is that I will be your God and you will be my people and you shall worship me alone. And so this statement reflects that. Okay, Romans chapter 10, verses 9 through 10. So I'm going to read that for us. Okay, hey, Bob. That if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe that you believe and are justified and is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. Okay. 
So this is, seems to be saying that is it, an, it isn't enough for you to just hold it in, right? Paired with the belief in your heart that Jesus is Lord is also the verbal spoken confession of that faith. Now, that, does that have to be exactly in the format that we do? No. no right? <laughs> but it does need to be expressed. Right? Okay. So this is a rich tradition. It isn't something that came about with Luther in the, in the 15th century. It's from way, way, way back. And we're going to go through some of the three big creeds that the Christian church has used throughout the centuries. Um, but it goes back even further than that, the tradition of a creed, of a spoken confession of faith as God's people. Okay. All right. So we have the three ecumenical creeds. Does anybody know what the word ecumenical means? Going across denominations? Yeah. So it is... It is a word to express that this is, this is not a denominationally bound creed. So this isn't a Baptist creed or a Lutheran creed. These are creeds that the whole Christian church uses. Right? Um, <clears throat> now, some churches you may go to and they don't use them regularly, but there aren't any Christian churches really that say that they full on disagree with what these creeds say. They're general Christian confession of faith. Okay. So you may say, well, I have a Baptist friend, and they don't even, they, they say the Apostles' Creed once every three years, and they have no idea really what it's about. That may be true, okay? But that doesn't mean that their church doesn't believe the very same things that are echoed in that creed. Right? So that, at the very least, is still probably true for the most part, okay? But we would say, given what we just read in Romans, that it's not just important to believe those things, but to do what with those things? To speak them. Speak them. Right. To speak them. Very good. All right. So blank or baptismal creed is the Apostles Creed. Very good. So the Apostles Creed did not reach its final form until about the 8th century, but its basic structure and content existed in creedal form from as early as the 2nd century. And it is a summary of the doctrine of the Apostles. And the doctrine of the apostles are simply what they were going out and teaching after they were sent out by Jesus. Right? Um, and we do know, we don't know exactly what form it took, but we do know that like common recitation of a confession, uh, a statement of belief, was something that was already happening when Paul was around. Right? Um, so there's already an, a common, sort of common understanding to the, the wording and form of Christian worship, even in the first century. Okay. Now, it may have looked a little different or sounded a bit different than what we do, apart from a few things, right? We know the words of institution are pretty much verbatim what they were then, right? Spoken in a different language, but the same word, same meaning, right? Um, but the parts of the service, like the service of the word and the service of the sacrament is a form that establishes itself very early on. Okay. Um, and the, the service of the word, did that start with Christian the Christian church. No. No. No, where did it start? With Judaism. With Judaism in the synagogues, right? So we have the uh, Jesus reading the scroll of Isaiah in the synagogue, right? So that was a form of worship that went all the way back to the Old Testament, the gathering and the reading of God's word, right? Which is why when we do that here, what's our response to it? Praise Thanks be to God, right? We're praising God for the gift of his word because apart from that, you wouldn't have any idea. Jesus had done, right? Um, so that started a long time ago. And then the service of the sacraments was started, of course, when a new covenant is established in Jesus. And so we know because churches wrote back to Paul that he established, and they were like, well, you know, what's going on with, we've got some people here saying weird stuff about what you told us about the Lord's Supper. And then Paul writes back, some of you guys are having all of the food and leaving none for others, and that is not the Lord's Supper that you're celebrating. So when I teach about that, I always give people the image of, imagine you're standing in line to go up to communion, and the guy in front of you just drains the whole common cup. Right? That's not the celebration of the Lord's Supper. Right? So sometimes people will jokingly tell me, hey, Pastor, today was, this week was extra rough. Maybe I should get a little bit more of the blood of Jesus. Right? And they're joking around, because it isn't really about the quantity or the taste or the quality of the wine. 
Uh, it's about the reception of, of the gift. Okay, so that's the Apostles' Creed. Starts way back. Let's open up our Bibles to Acts chapter 2, verse 42. Whenever somebody's there, if they want to read it for us. Go ahead, Cooper. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. All right. That's pretty much what we do in 2021. Right there. And the, the apostles' teachings would be this confession in the doctrine of the apostles, what we now know as the apostles' creed. So some form of this. Because what, and actually our, 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 uh, our gospel, our uh, Acts reading today from Peter talked about this, right? What is he revealing when he preaches? He's not talking about the Ten Commandments. He's not talking about anything that's going on in the Old Testament. What is he revealing? He's revealing that everything that you've been taught by the law and the prophets was fulfilled in this man, Jesus, whom you killed. And so that's the apostles' teaching, is that Jesus is the Messiah, and he did accomplish the salvation of the world. And he rose victorious, proving all that's true. Right? Um, so that's what's being revealed in the apostles' teaching. All right. Blank is customarily used in the divine service of Holy Communion. It was formulated by the leaders of the church in the 4th century in the town of Nicaea. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. It was drawn up at the First Ecumenical Council, AD 325, to counter the heretical teachings of Arius, who taught that Jesus was less than true God. Which one's that? Nicene Creed, right? Where do you get God's name from? Nicaea, right? The place where it was put together. Okay, so that's the Nicene Creed. Wasn't that right after Constantine became a Christian? Just before. Just before. Constantine is like 355, I believe. Okay. Um, so, or I might be mixing that up. I'm not sure. I'd have to look that one up. Or you, if you've got a smartphone, you can look it up and you can enlighten all of us. Um, okay, so with the Nicene Creed, so I want to highlight that last sentence there. To counter the heretical teachings of Arius who taught that Jesus was less than true God. Okay. So one of the cool things, and, and I can maybe do this at some point, it's really beyond the scope of this class, but you can go through the creeds line by line and basically see how each line is specifically addressing an early church heretical movement. In other words, a big ongoing discussion on what exactly are the apostles teaching about this guy, Jesus? Almost all of them are related to Jesus. Because even though you and I have heard it a bunch of times, it is an extremely radical claim to say that God became fully man, subjected himself fully to his own laws and creation, and died. And so it makes sense that if that's the claim you're making, most of the early church confusion about the nature of God is going to be about the incarnation of the true God, true man, Jesus. Right? And so the creeds were the church formally gathering together and saying, here's what we believe the scriptures are attesting to regarding the truth of who Jesus is and was and have released our salvation. Date for Constantine. Yeah, uh, it was Constantine and the first council of Nicaea. He was overseeing that. Okay. I was only like 50 50 sure on that. That's why I was asking. <laughs> You're right. I was wrong. So wrong. You weren't wrong. You weren't sure. <laughs> well, thank you for being very gracious. <laughs> but I learned something new. It's not good. Um, or I remembered something I forgot one of the two. Um, okay. So that was right around the time that Christianity was becoming less, like, horribly persecuted. Um, so so uh, um, then we have the third one, and uh, you may have nightmares about this one, I'm not sure. Uh, blank is the most lengthy of the three creeds. It was named after the great teacher of Christian orthodoxy, Athanasius. Wait, wait. Wait, wait, that's not, yeah. This creed was composed in the early 4th century to defend the deity of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thus, it clearly confesses the doctrine of the Trinity. It, it is recited in the Divine Service on Trinity Sunday, which is coming up, actually. So you'll, we'll get to be speaking this pretty soon. What's the name of that one? The Athanasian Creed. That one's pretty hard to forget because it's super long and extremely philosophically thorough. Right. Um, 
And in that, so like, if you don't know the history of the creed, then you're reading that and you're just like, good grief, man. You said the same thing four times in a row, four different ways. Why are you doing that? Well, he's doing that to make it abundantly clear in addressing a false teaching about the Trinity. Right. And so that's why that is so wordy and so laden with sort of a metaphysics of philosophy about the Trinity is because it's addressing that particular controversy. Right. Okay. Any questions about any of those? Okay. Turn to page 129 in your catechisms. So we learned what the word creed means. What is a creed? Question 104. I'm getting me glitter on my catechism. The creed summarizes all God's work in creation and human history as taught in the Bible. So uh, maybe another way to put that is a creed is a nice window into the narrative of scripture. It gives you a really general overview of the, it highlights the super important parts of the scriptures, right? Um, the cliff notes. The yeah, there we go. The cliff notes, right? Um, and that's one of the reasons why, why uh, Luther includes it in the small catechism, right? Because his goal in the small catechism is to teach the essential basics of the Christian faith. The stuff you must know in order to really believe in Jesus as your Lord and Savior, right? And so the creed is a nice summary, cliff note version of the narrative of scripture. Okay, next question here. I'm gonna make sure I don't have this in the back. This is, I don't, okay. Question 105 on page 129 the Catechism. What can we learn about, or can we learn about God apart from the Bible? So this would be learning about God from maybe natural law. History. History? How do you learn about God from history? Apart from the Bible. Oh. <laughs> the Bible does tell us that there are ways that we do encounter and know God apart from the scriptures. What do you know? It's in the Huh? Okay, so like immediate revelation from God could be a potential thing. What's the verse in Psalms about uh, heaven testifying their glory? Yeah, oh. right. So there's a verse in Psalms. I don't know the exact verse off the top of my head where it talks about that the, the heavens testify to the glory of God. Mm -hmm. Right. So if we go with that route, that would be like the natural argument that the, the universe itself begets the idea of God because it had to have gotten here somehow. Um, and, and attest to his glory. So what, what for just from that, what can we know about God? All powerful. Huh? The fact that he's all powerful. Okay, he's all powerful. That he creates. He creates. Mm -hmm. That he creates. <clears throat> How about flat at home? It's this gorgeous mountain and sunset and mountain lake and it says one only has to open his eyes to see the glory of god right. you know they're talking about creation if you see creation and realize no man could make what we see around us right that gives glory to god in, 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 in his awesome you know creator role right so we have creator and all powerful which i think yeah. sort of sums that up right there really isn't a whole lot specifically that we can know about God just from creation. We can know there is a God, right? And people argue that, but it's really a nonsense argument. Um, like, if, even if you just look at the mathematics, like I remember watching a video on, like, you know, you have the theory of evolution, which says, well, it just takes a really, 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 really long time and random chance. Um, but that's not the way that works. So like even just forming, um, the, the protein inside of a cell as an undesigned function would never work. Because if it's in the wrong order in any way, it's totally useless. It's not partially useless. It's not sort of close and sort of functions. It just doesn't function at all. Right? And so um, it takes a lot of mental gymnastics to look at the order of creation 
and come up with the idea that that was somehow born out of disorder in James, right? Of course, you can always ask the question of where did that come from? Where did that come from? Where did that come from? And, and there's two points that you look at nature and see that God is powerful and God is creator. You know, like every religion, every pagan religion, every, you know, everything since since humans first appeared has basically worshipped. Made that God same sort of assertion, right? Yeah. And, and really, that's a great point, right? So uh, every form of human religion attempts to reflect the glory, the glory of a god or multiple gods as they see creation coming to them, right? The harvest, the, the fertility, the, the miracle of, the, of having children, the, the, the beauty of nature and the sunset and the sky, the power of the sun and the power of the seasons and all those sorts of things, right, are born from that idea. But the point that's being made here is, like, apart from the scriptures, what would our creed look like? What would our confession of faith look like? It would basically be, I believe in a all-powerful God who created the heavens and the earth. And that's pretty much it. Yeah. It would be a lot like the Native American faith. <clears throat> well, it would be a lot like pretty much every other form of religion, right? That the the initial and basic understanding of God is is a reflection of, of the Creator, right, and of His power. And beyond that, there's not much given. Yeah. Yeah, there was a verse I was looking for. It's in Romans chapter 1, verse 20, which sums this up. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made, right? So in other words, like, I guess our creation is so oh. profound and, and mighty and right. overwhelming. <clears throat> and then he says, so they are without excuse. And it's sort of like, well, if anybody rejects God, well, <laughs> yeah, right, right. And, and so the, the, um, it's important to know that it's important to know one, the point that Cooper's making that like, you don't have to have been shared scripture verses to know there is a God, right? Uh, the Bible says that it's written into the created nature of the world and unto the hearts of men, right? Um, and then there is specifically talking about, uh, for example, did anyone have to tell you that you don't like people stealing your stuff? <laughs> well, hold on a second. I got a comeback to that. Because there are cultures who do not have the pronoun I or mine, and everything is we. Nobody owns anything. It is collective amongst the group. That, that is a minor difference, but not a total difference. Because even in a community like that, if you have somebody who isolates himself from the community and steals from the community, it's still considered wrong. Yes. Right? So a total difference from that would be that you would be lauded and glorified for stealing from others. There's never been a culture that does that, right? And if there was, it lasted for five seconds. And it was only by one person who was doing the stealing. Right? And then my follow-up question is, who told you that that was wrong? What authority are you appealing to? Yourself. Yourself? But, I mean, I stole something that I wanted, and I have it now, and I feel pretty great about it. So myself is telling me this is a pretty cool deal. Right? Where, what is your conscience referencing, other than your own personal feelings? Huh? Well, we don't know anything about the Holy Spirit. The person comes to look for you that you stole from. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> well, you go. It, it wasn't so great for you. But the point is, like, everybody seems to believe in a certain code of behavior that nobody explicitly told them about. And yet, we didn't get together and have a powwow at the beginning of the human race and say, okay, this is bad, this is good, this should be, this should be celebrated, this shouldn't be celebrated. And you can see it right now in our culture. Our culture is attempting to just fully get rid of that. And it's failing pretty terribly at it. Because even when you hear somebody saying they want to advocate for something that is terrible, then the very next sentence is how somebody wronged them because they violated this, uh, this objective standard of behavior that everybody seems to know about. And the philosophy, the philosopher in me is like, wait, you can't do that. You either have to say there is an objective standard that you don't get to dictate to, 
where there isn't, right? So you can't pick that up when you like it and when you don't like it, just toss it aside. And so the typically, C.S. Lewis has a really great introduction in Mere Christianity about this, so I highly recommend reading. Um, but he sort of talks about it as like, it is the score on which the musical notes are played. And so everybody's got the musical notes, but the objective standard of behavior is like the musical score that actually orders them properly. Right? And, and the best way to tell whether or not you think somebody's really thinking that this isn't a real objective standard is to wrong them in some way and see how they react. So if you wrong somebody, they almost always have the same sort of, oh, hey, you stole my seat. <laughs> or, hey, that was mine. Like, who told you about that? Who said that that wasn't something I could just do? Right? And it's so ingrained that people sometimes miss it. Right? So we do have, we do know some things about God based on what is naturally revealed, right? That he, that there are objective realities to the universe, that he's all powerful, that he created things, and that there are, they seem to be designed for a purpose, right? And there are things that one ought not to do, but that's about as far as we get. Right? And that's, that, the, the term for that is, that is a theistic worldview. In other words, it's just a worldview that has a God, that is a, a being of some sort. Apart from the scriptures, that's pretty much all we can know. And so our creed would be pretty, pretty bare bones, right? <clears throat> oh, I should have looked. Russ, we should have looked on page one twenty nine. It's Psalm nineteen one. It's right there for us. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims His handiwork. Right. Um, and the Romans one twenty passage is there too. <laughs> it's almost like somebody compiled those things nicely for us in a book called the Catechism. We just didn't read it. Okay. <laughs> All right. So then the next question is then why do we need the Bible or a summary of the Bible such as the creed? So although creation gives witness to its creator, it does not reveal his identity and name. In some ways, creation gives us the first chapter of the story, the Bible, and its summary in the creed gives us the rest of that story. The Bible teaches us to know God more fully and for our salvation. When did uh, God reveal his name? We were talking to Moses. Oh, I am. Yeah, right? <clears throat> Yahweh, I, I am who I am. I, I am. Um, which is just like if you've studied it in multiple languages, that's like the base verb or existential discussion. The I am verb. So God is just, it just is. Right? Um, <clears throat> okay. Hop back to our outline on the handout. Um, so that is what we are confessing our faith in. We're not just confessing our faith in like the general nature of God that we see from creation. That's just a small part. We're also confessing the special revelation of God from his holy scriptures. And that's what gives us all of the specificity about the Trinity. Could somebody explain to me how you would get the Trinity just by looking at a mountain sunrise? <laughs> right? I don't even know about it, and I still don't understand it. Right? The only reason I know about it is because God told me about himself. Right? We have, we have to do this with other humans, right? I can't really know what's going on in your mind. You have to tell me. And so unless you tell me, it remains an invisible attribute of Bob Booth. Because I can't read his mind, nor he mine, right? So, letter C, what does it mean to say I believe? We are not saved by merely believing, but by blank in God. Faith in God, right? Faith's object is always God as he gives himself to us in his word, right? So that's an underline the word object there, right? A lot of times, what do we do with faith? Who do we credit the faith to? Ourselves. Ourselves, right? We turn faith into like this self-generated like exuberance. Or like and, a work. Or like a work. <laughs> yeah. Right? If only I had faith more, if only I had believed more strongly or felt God more strongly, I would be a better Christian. No, no, no. It's not how it works, right? Faith is not something you generate. Faith is something given to you from outside of yourself in another object, in another thing, right? So if we're friends and I habitually lie to you, 
Do you have faith in me? No. Right? And your your lack of faith in me is not because you're not excited enough for me. It's because I've, I'm not trustworthy, right? So I'm not actually generating any faith in you. Right? So it's the object of faith that actually generates the faith. Whereas if I'm a friend who's always telling you the truth, even when it's maybe not convenient for me to do so, and we come into a conversation where you really want the truth about something, you know who to ask because you have faith in that person that they're going to tell you the truth, even if it's inconvenient for them, right? So in that instance, we would say that that person has generated faith, faith <clears throat> in them within you. So it's the object of faith that is generating the faith within you. So what's the object of our faith? God, specifically as he operates in Christ. in Christ, right? Does he have a pretty good track record? Yeah, a perfect one actually, right? And so our faith in him is justified because it's being created by him within us. Because he doesn't lie to us. He has accomplished salvation in us. He has declared promises and he has kept them and all those sorts of things. Yeah, but the track record is so good when we're when we're faithless, he's still faithful. That's how exactly. good his track record is. Exactly. And that really is the underpinning of the entire <laughs> hope that you can have in the gospel. Okay. And I can't emphasize that enough, right? It's not that sanctification does not matter. It does, and we'll get to that. But it does not in a sense, really matter at all when it comes to justification. You could be a horrible, worthless person your entire life, and mere moments before you die, come to have genuine faith in Jesus, you will be in heaven. That is the nature of grace, right? And we can't do the disservice of attaching some sort of performative aspect to God's love in Jesus, because he does not do that himself, right? So that is fully on him which is why our faith in him is totally justified. It's also consequently why Paul says that we are the people most to be pitied if Jesus didn't rise from the dead. Because all our hope and faith relies on him alone. Right? You had something wrong? Yeah. Granted, we don't know the answer for sure, but what about those who have very, very strong religions, but it has not yet uh, all of a sudden turned into a faith or evolved into a faith yet? Sure. Um, so the same principle applies, right? So could you envision yourself or somebody else going to church every Sunday yet not believing? I can envision that. I can envision it because maybe my dad is going to church and my wife will stop nagging. Or, or maybe I'm a kid who's going to church because my parents won't let me do anything else. Or maybe I'm someone who's just going because I've been so influenced by the nurturing things in my life where they told me this is something you must do, but they never bother to explain why. So I'm just going through the motions. Right. I, I had a conversation with a young adult at my previous church who grew up Catholic. And in his own words, said to me that when he started dating a Lutheran girl, she brought him to Fairlawn, which is my previous church. That was the first time in his whole life he'd ever heard the gospel. And he'd been going to a Catholic church his entire life. Like for the first 16 years of his life, he went to the Catholic church every week, at least once. Right? So the, the, the same principle applies. Right? And so a, a really powerful sermon the senior pastor at my previous church preached, and I'm probably going to steal this and use it at some point, is he just started with asking the question, why are you here? And then just like pause for like five full seconds. <laughs> Why are you here? Because there's all kinds of reasons why people could be there on Sunday, but there's only one real. Right? And so the, the sermon was about if there's something other than, and he was using the text that shows the picture of worship of Jesus in eternity in Revelation, gathered around the throne of Lamb. Right? It's like that's what we're doing. We only worship on Sunday. And if there's any other reason you're here, you're here for the wrong reason. You're here because the pastor is so attractive. You're here because the pastor preaches a great sermon. If you're here because they have amazing kids programs, all wrong reasons to come to church. They can be like secondary benefits and things that churches should do, but those are never reasons for going to church. Okay. All right. 
So face object is the thing that generates the faith. Right? And our face object, of course, is Christ. Okay? There are three dimensions to the opening line of the creed, I believe. Knowledge, assent, and trust. Okay? Note what each of these passages teach about the faith we confess. So let's open up James 2, verse 19. Okay. You believe that God is one. You do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. All right. All right. So then we have multiple times in scripture where Jesus actually has to actively close up the mouths of the demons so that they won't tell other people who he actually is. And there are some times that they actually do say, right? What are you doing here, the Holy One of God? Right? So it isn't just that you know who Jesus is. It's more than just knowledge. Okay. Now, for, for those who have faith, it's hard to imagine that you'd be like, okay, well, if Jesus is the Son of God, then why wouldn't you believe him? Mm -hmm. But it is more than just knowing who Jesus is. That is the point that James makes. All right, 1 Corinthians 8. Somebody got that one? I have it. Go for it. For although there may be so-called gods in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom all are all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom all th are all things through whom we exist. Okay. We get a little of the confusing Nicene Creed language there. <laughs> right? Because God the Father and God the Son are both fully God. Right? Um, so he used that same phrase, from whom all things and from whom we exist, right, uh, for both. So there is believing versus belief there. So for although there may be so-called God, so it isn't just believing in something that saves you, right, but the right belief. So there is a, they did Christian Day at the ballpark at Bush Stadium in St. Louis, and Tony Dungy, who's a, uh, famous football coach, but also a pretty outspoken Christian guy um, who gave a little presentation. One of the things he talked about, they had some decision theology there, which I wasn't really a big fan of because they passed around a little slip of paper where you could check a box saying that I've, I've dedicated my life to Christ or whatever, um, which we, of course, know if you check that box, that means he's already got you and he's the one who did it, not you. But anyway, he said he gave the image of if you go to an airport and you want to get to a certain place, does it matter which plane you get on? <laughs> of course it does, right? Because one plane is going to Japan and one's going to Alaska and one's going to Mexico. So if you're going to the beach in Mexico and you get on the wrong plane, you're not going to go to the beach in Mexico, right? And so he was using that as an image to illustrate that the object of your faith, that which you have right belief in, is important, right? Because if your, your faith is in the wrong pilot, you're going to the wrong place. Right? And so that's what is being made distinguished here. It's not just believing, because that this is an art. I mean, this may seem weird to you, but this is an argument that people make, right? As long as you believe genuinely enough, it doesn't really matter what you believe in. Okay. Can and you purposely pick a, a former Pittsburgh Steeler for this audience? What? <laughs> Tony Genji was a former Pittsburgh Steeler. Did you oh, pick him? I didn't even know that. Even know that. I okay. didn't even know that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure he didn't know that. <laughs> I also picked him because he was the very person that was speaking when I was there at that time. <laughs> so, um, <clears throat> all right, then Psalm 31, verse 14. Somebody have that? <clears throat> Read for us. Psalm 31, verse 14. I have. But I trust in you, Lord. I say you are my God. All right. Love that. Just pretty straightforward. Mm. Right. I trust in you, Lord. Why? For you are my God. You are my God. Very good. And I love it when you'll read a psalm and it's a psalm of like lament or complaint. And they're like, Where are you, God? Why have you let my enemies conquer me and, and succeed? And I cry out to you in anguish. My soul is in sorrow. And then there's always a point where it's like, but you are the God of my father, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who's, who released us from slavery in Egypt with a mighty hand, who has done great and mighty works for me. 
right? So despite the fact that they have a, a lamentation in their life and they're voicing that complaint, that lamentation to God, they've never expressed disbelief in who he is, right? They always end by saying, but you are God and you have done these things, right? So that's once again, the belief in the right object of faith. That makes the difference there. All right, and then Hebrews 11. Everybody kind of knows this one, the great faith chapter in the Bible. Well, faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. By faith, we understand that the universe was formed at God's command, so that what is seen is not made out of what is visible. All right. Did you get all that? Faith is the assurance of things hoped for mm -hmm. and the conviction of things not seen. How many of you here have personally seen Jesus? Me either. Not physically, <laughs> but sure, oftentimes. Well, not physically, that's what I'm getting yeah. at. But right? up here, yeah. Well, because this, what is this, what is this verse is getting at, like the what your physical eyes see, mm -hmm. right? That's not what faith is about. So don't be surprised if you're asked to believe things that you haven't personally more witnessed, right? Um, and then this isn't a new thing, right? Maybe you think it's a new thing. You read the Bible and you're like, oh man, if I saw the pillar of fire and I saw the quail and the manna from heaven and the big smoky cloud and all the voices of God that are in the scriptures, well, surely I would believe. And, and he says here, for by it is, or for by it, the people of old received their commendation. In other words, the thing that commended them to God was not their faith in those things, the faith in the things that weren't shown to them. Right? That's the point Paul makes about Isaac when Abraham goes to sacrifice Isaac. Was he putting his hope in something unseen? Well, yeah, because everything he could see was not great for him, right? And not only would it be horrible to sacrifice your child in the first place, but this is the child that he and his wife prayed about. It's their miracle baby. And then God says this to him. Right? Yeah, and at that point, uh, Abraham was, a, was an ancient man. And uh, you know, Isaac was a strapping young youth. I mean, he, Abraham was lost like that. Yep. <laughs> but by faith, we understand that the universe was created by the word of God. So that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. In other words, um, I, this is where I always love drawing things back to the creative word of God. Because all of a sudden, something that I say that sounds crazy is like, well, but if you believe this, then this is like small potato. Right? So like, if you're hung up about, well, yeah, but you know, how can it be the bread and wine and the body and blood at the same time? It doesn't taste like body and blood. When does it happen? How does that work? You're like, wait a minute, wait a minute. You believe in a God that said, let there be light, and there was. <laughs> you believe in a God that said, that formed the universe and everything in it. And he's speaking those same words here. This is like nothing. Right? So then where is the issue of faith? Right? It's in the fact that they want to trust in their rational mind rather than, oh, I just realized I wasn't using the microphone. Can you hear me back there? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Jan was making some faces and I was like, wait a minute. I didn't use the mic. Can you repeat everything you've said? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, All right, I'll start over from the very beginning. Strap in. Yeah. We have eight minutes left though, so I'll, I'll just talk really, really fast. Okay, is that better? Yeah. Sorry about that. Yeah. I'm talking about the old testament. Yeah. Did the people in the Old Testament, their belief was in God. Did they think about Jesus coming? Or so what saved them was the faith in the promise of Jesus, the same way that it saves you. Right? Our belief is in our faith is in Jesus because we believe in the promise of the Messiah and that it was fulfilled in Jesus. So I was I kind of read like a bow tie image for the Old Testament through the New Testament, and Christ is the the centerpiece that holds the whole thing together. And we're, we have the same image, right? We're looking back and they're looking forward, but it's faith in the promise of God that he's going to send a Savior, right? Um, and for us, it's just, you make those words past tense, right? 
faith that God has sent the Savior and he has accomplished the thing that he sent him to do. So that's a good question. Question. Yeah. It, Russ. Feels, it, it feels almost uh, absurd to, to be real, able to rely on my own faith, to be able to rely on, on faith as it exists inside me. But the, right. Because, I mean, to your earlier point, to that point of that verse about what's for those who haven't seen, Peter saw the transfiguration mm. and, and then, like, randoms on the street in Jerusalem got him to, to say, I don't know. You know what I mean? Like, right. so that's the absolute counter to any inclination we may have to think if I could just see it, if I could just mm -hmm. hear his voice, right. I would be, I'd be right. fine. We wouldn't be. Like, yeah. our right. faith is so inconstant. It's we so are just moment by moment. We're just crud, basically. I mean, it really is. I mean, like, I had the same thought when you read about uh, God's deliverance of Egypt culminated in the parting of the Red Sea and the coming down of the pillar of fire to block the advance of Pharaoh's army, and you get to the other side, and only in a mere, like, three days without the most comfortable five-star hotel environment, and you're saying that you brought us out here to die. It's like, what? Like, for one, if I saw it, I, I would like to think, although the point we're making is I wouldn't, right, that if I saw a giant pillar of fire come down from the sky, that I should probably think twice about complaining about whoever can do that. <laughs> um, but we don't, right? And so I think the message that scriptures constantly give, and Jesus is sort of the harshest preacher on this, is that he's just like, you are terrible. Stop trusting in yourself. You're, you're just not going to be able to do it, even if it's small. It just doesn't work, right? So that's what that's his response. People are like, just show us a sign and we'll know who you are. But they've all been given. If you still do not believe, you won't if more signs are given. Right? And so... That's why I like the, the, the object of faith talk, right? Where like we really totally 100% are at the mercy of God, right? So this was like the theme of Job when I was taking the uh, systematics two class at the seminary. The theme of Job, most people think is usually about enduring suffering and faith, right? But that's not really what Job is about. What Job is about is the simple reality that God is God and you are not. And that because he's God, he can't do whatever he pleases. You are at his mercy by virtue of your existential state as a creature. And so then the gospel is all that much more gracious because what we're being told in scripture is what God chose to do for us and the way that he feels about us when he could do whatever he wanted. Right? And we, we would say, because we're coming from the perspective of the human creature, Oh, God is so cruel in the Old Testament. I mean, he does all these terrible things. He murders all these people. He tells his followers to kill all these people, and he's a terrible person. But that's only true if all of them weren't really justifiably worth killing in the first place, which is basically what original sin teaches. Right? So then the, then the whole of Scripture is really about the mercy, patience, and grace of God fully manifested, of course, in Jesus. Right? And so the the point that's made is like, don't underestimate your own ineptitude as a result of sin. It's probably far more extreme than you would think. And here are some examples. Like maybe you thought that if God came down from heaven and he sent a scary eye-covered angel, you would believe because you saw those things. Well, let me tell you a story about a bunch of people who saw all that stuff and still didn't. Right? So stop trusting in yourself. Trust in me. Right. I'm going to do the thing that you cannot. Right. And, that, and that's the, of course, the glory of Jesus. Okay. Great point. Confessing the name of God. God introduces himself and reveals his name in the Old Testament. So that Exodus 3 passage there is the burning book, burning bush uh, passage that Rob uh, referenced. So we're at the, the very bottom of the first page of our outline here. Um, and that's when, Jesus, when God reveals his name, right? And he reveals it once again as an act of mercy, because why is he revealing his name? They don't know what to call him. Well, they don't know what to call him, but who specifically asks for his name? Moses. Moses. And why does he ask for him? Who should I say? Because um, he doesn't want to go. <laughs> He's like, well, you're sending me in, and I don't know your name, so, <laughs> so what do I do when I get there? And God was like, well, I'll give you my name. And then Moses is probably like, <laughs> I thought that would get me out of the gig. 
but it doesn't, right? Oh, it says, his name revealed to Moses in Hebrew is Yahweh, Y-A-H-W-E-H. -H. Um, I could write it in Hebrew, but that's really not what it helps. Um, so, and this is a big deal, right? Big deal. And it's treated as a huge deal from here on until we get to Jesus. You are not allowed to say the name of God out loud, right? And so this next part in here, uh, if you've ever noticed in the scriptures that sometimes the word Lord is all caps, and sometimes it's just regular, like the L's cap the rest of the lowercase. Uh, that's the difference between God's personal name. So that's the way we differentiate between God's name in English is always all caps. So Lord in all caps equals Yahweh, okay? The personal name of God. And if you see Lord where it's just the first letters capitalized, that's a title applied to him. So you may have heard words like Adonai or Mashiach, right? Those are titles. And so that's why they're not all caps, right? And it was important for them to distinguish that because you were not allowed to say the whole personal name of God out loud. It was only written. Okay. The Hebrews even went so far that after writing Yahweh, they had to throw the pen away. Yeah. I mean, it was, it was a huge, huge deal, right? And it really is a big deal that the God of the universe gave you his name. Right, he gave his people his name. Like you don't tell everybody your name. Like when you randomly pass someone in the grocery store and they ask you a random question, you don't say, oh, hi, my name is Pete. <laughs> right, because you don't know this person. They don't really want to know you, right? And they're just asking you a question, right? So it, what does it signify when you give somebody your personal name? A relationship. A relationship. A relationship. How does this enhance the meaning of number 6, 22 to 27? Does anybody know what that is before we look at it? We just, I'll give you a hint, we just all said it. Yeah, it's the benediction. That, and that comes straight from Numbers chapter 6. And I'm going to speak that over you here. And think about what we just learned about all caps Lord versus Lord. And I'll just use Yahweh when I read it, so you know the difference. And Yahweh spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the people of Israel and say to them, When I, oh wait, I started the wrong verse. Sorry. I was like, that doesn't sound right. There we go. Yahweh spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to Aaron and his sons. So Aaron and his sons are the priests of Israel, um, those specifically called to minister to the people of God. Thus you shall bless the people of Israel. You shall say to them, Yahweh bless you and keep you. Yahweh make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. And Yahweh lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. So they shall put my name upon the people of Israel and I will bless them. Right? So this blessing isn't just like a general well-wishing. It's literally the application of the personal name of God. So typically, this is done by the pastor alone because of the way that it's set up here, right? So it doesn't say the Lord spoke to Moses saying, like, have everybody say this together. He says, speak to Aaron and his sons, so that Aaron and his sons are specifically called as priests to serve in the temple on behalf of the people and speak to God on their behalf as well. Speak to Aaron and his sons saying, thus you shall bless the people of Israel. So thus you shall speak to the people of Israel. Okay. And then Yahweh bless you and keep you. So how does that enhance the meaning? Because I think most of us probably, myself included, when we say that, we think of it more along the lines of, have a great day. <laughs> right? It's just a, a general well-wishing. Right, and that and that a blessing in that sense. And that, that is a form of blessing, but here it's much more specific, right? It's a blessing because the name of God, the personal name of God, is being applied to you. And what does that mean? That means you have a relationship with him, that means he's your God. Um, and he says here, right? So they so shall they put my name upon the people of Israel, and I will bless them. Right, so that God is blessing you by putting his name on you. Pretty cool stuff, I think. All right. Um, then this last one here, and then we're, then we're a little over time already, so we'll be done. Uh, number two, what is God's personal name revealed in the New Testament? See Matthew 121. Huh? Joshua. 
We got a fancy one right here. <laughs> Yeshua, Yahshua. Why are you going with the Yahweh? <laughs> well, yeah, that's in Hebrew. What does it mean in English? Jesus, Jesus right? Jesus. So the first blank there is Jesus. What is God's personal name revealed in the New Testament? It's Jesus. What does Jesus mean? Saves. Yahweh, Yahweh saves. saves. God saves. Yahweh saves. All right. So if you got anything from class today, it's important to speak your confession of faith, not just hold it in your heart. Right? They're sort of not ever divorced in the scriptures. They're always together. And God gave you his name. He initiated a relationship with you, his people collectively, and he places his name upon you to bless you. Where else does he do that other than the blessing at the end of the service? Baptism. Right? And that's for our sake, by the way. He made a visible element promise so that we had something tangible that we could rely on. It was like, was I baptized? Yes, I was baptized because some dude dumped water on my head when I was a baby. I said some words. Right? So I know that God is claiming as his own. Right? Okay. Let's uh, close with a word of prayer. And as always, I just want to remind again, since we're starting a new unit, um, all joking aside from the beginning, if you do have a question related over any of the material we've gone over so far that just randomly occurred to you the week prior, please ask it in class. The purpose of this is, is to, to learn our faith in more depth. So, all right, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we give you thanks. We give you thanks that you have initiated a relationship with us. You sought out Abraham when he was only Abram. And you brought him to you. You gave your personal name to Moses. Even though he was trying to, as we often do, weasel out of the task that you're trying to give him. In your mercy, your response was, I am your God. Here's my name. Help us to trust in the promise of your faithfulness. Help us to know that our faith is justified in you, not because it's so great and that we generate it, but because it's generated by your son Jesus and what he has done for us. So when we're despairing or down or feeling the burden of our sin, lift us up with the promise of Jesus, that we are saved, that you have placed your name upon us in Jesus, in our baptism, and that we are yours, simply put. All these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a great week, everybody.